Hello and welcome back to Stephen C Ministries. Today we're joined by a dear sister of mine, Carrie. Carrie was heavily involved in the occult for over two decades and served as a satanic high priestess of a witch's coven. Today, Carrie has dedicated her life to serving the Lord Jesus Christ and exposing darkness. You can find all of Carrie's links, as always, in the description box below, including a book she features in, which I highly encourage you to check out. Finally, I'd ask that if you feel led, you consider liking, subscribing, and maybe even commenting. Little things like that help out small YouTubers like me get this gospel message out to so many more people, and I'd really appreciate it. Thank you and enjoy the podcast. So, Kerry, thank you so much for coming on today and being willing to share a little bit more about your story. Everybody's heard a bit about you and where they can find you in a brief introduction video, but I'd love it if you could share a little bit more about your life before you met Christ. I was in witchcraft for 23 years. Um, of those 23 years, 13 of those years, I was a high priestess. Um, it all began when I was seven years old and I had seen my grandfather after he passed away. What I assumed was my grandfather. Now I, you know, I know better than that, but it was something that the enemy used to trigger me into looking to ways to communicate with him to find out why he had appeared to me. Um, I started out, you know, just kind of, cause I grew up in church. You know, I grew, I grew up in church. I should have known better, but that's how sly the enemy is when he starts sneaking into you. You know, that's why you've got to stay on guard and be vigilant because those little whispers that he does in your ear, you know, he can pull you away so easily if you're not watching out. And, you know, I, these little thoughts started coming in, you know, like, why did he, why did I see him? Why did he appear to me? You know, what did he want? Is there something he wanted to say? And when I went, you know, I took it to my Sunday school teacher and, you know, I was preteen, very young. And when I told her what happened, you know, her response, which she was correct in what she said, but her response was, you know, it's a, it's a demon that was not your grandfather, leave it alone, you know, and left it at that. And God has a plan and purpose for your life and he puts people in your life. The enemy also has a plan for your life and he can put people into your life. And right at that time, um, I had befriended a young man who at the time I didn't know was involved in Satanism and in witchcraft. And when I started telling him, you know, what was going on and everything, he was like, you know, there's ways that you can find out. And he told me, he said, we can, you know, we can get a Ouija board and do a Ouija board. I was like, you know, my mom and dad are not going to let me have a Ouija board. And he uh, told me, he's like, you know, well, we can make one and it'll work just the same. So, you know, he taught me how to make one, uh, taught me how to use it. You know, I would fold it was I would fold it up and stick it in my closet, you know, when I was done playing with it. And that right there opened the door for what would be my descent into all of this is that that one simple question you know that the enemy had had planted in me is what drew me down this this dark spiral um I, after the the Ouija board you know I started getting more interested into things of the occult, uh, witchcraft books, which he, you know, that friend was so available to give me these books and, and different things that he had, you know, and I, I, I started, you know, looking into how to do tarot cards. And I mean, I was about 13 years old at this time. So, you know, it, it, it started so young and those things, you know, like the world today makes those things seem so innocent. And, there is such a, a, a danger in exposing yourself to any of that. Um, when, when you open a door, when you, when you open the door for, for the devil, even, even if it's just a little crack, he's going to push his way in. It might not be immediate, but he's going to push his way through if you keep opening yourself up to it. So I started writing out, you know, writing out spells. I had, you know, all these books on witchcraft that he gave me. And what it was just so, 
I hate to keep saying that it was so innocent, but at that time it was like, I, I, I should have known better, but I didn't realize the door that I was opening up. And, you know, like today they have like the angel cards and the tarot cards and, you know, all these things that are available at these stores and people make so light of it, but that's all it took. That's all it took. And, you know, as I, as I got older, I got deeper into it. Um, I started out with Wicca and, you know, Wicca is made to seem like, you know, it's nature worship. You're, you're worshiping nature. They have, you know, these various goddesses and gods, that, but they make it seem again, so innocent. And the, you know, in, in any of this stuff, it's like the devil's not mentioned in it. So it's very deceiving. But the, the thing about the enemy after after being involved in all that stuff for 23 years, the thing about the enemy is this, is that people need to realize Satan doesn't care what you call him. He doesn't. He doesn't. As long as you're not serving God, as long as you're not serving Jesus, as long as Jesus is not your savior, Satan does not care what you call him. You can call him a goddess. You can call him a God. You can call him Sally. He does not care as long as you're not serving God. Um, so, you know, they, they make this seem like, it, you know, it's there's no devil in it. We don't we don't. The devil's not mentioned in it, but it is the devil. Like I said, he doesn't care what you call him. And so um, I started out in Wicca and um, did that for several years. And then it got to where there was a desire for more, more power, um, stronger spells. You know, it, it, it started spiraling. It's kind of like a snowball. It starts out small and the more it goes, the, the bigger it gets. The, so, so that little start in, in Wicca ended up where I, I felt like I wasn't getting answers. The, the spells seemed childish to me. I wanted something deeper. I wanted more than what it was giving me. And then I started practicing into Celtic witchcraft, got involved in a coven, was in the coven for years, got initiated as high priestess. And I did that for 13 years. And at the end of it, it I started associating with some people who were involved in Satanism. At that point, Stephen, I got to where the darker it was, the more evil it was, the more I craved it. Now, this started from being 12, 13 years old and, and looking into the, the supernatural, looking into the paranormal, looking in, you know, making a Ouija board out of a piece of paper got you to the point 23 years later involved in Satan worship. Um, I started uh, associating with these uh, friends of mine, and I use that term loosely as far as friends go, but um, started getting involved with them. They invited me over to do some rituals with them. Um, I started getting into darker books um, than a Comicron, um, started doing these satanic rituals. And I mean, the, the satanic rituals are crazy and intense. And I don't know as far as your audience goes, how much they honestly want to know about some of them. But, you know, it's very um, anything that's against God. The enemy glorifies. Absolutely. And as far as as far as the audience go, yeah, you can really go as deep as you feel comfortable going. I think that one of the things that I want to do with this podcast is to really introduce people to what these practices and religions are actually about, because so often when we see witchcraft, most people are informed by movies, TV, Hollywood. It, like you have such a vast amount of experience in these areas that I think people would really benefit from you explaining a bit about what Wicker is, what Celtic magic is, and eventually what Satanism is, what the practices look like. So you can really have, you have complete freedom to go as deep or as shallow as you want into each of those. With Wicca, and I think that that's almost what I would call a gateway. The reason I say that is because it is so 
concentrated like it it's an innocent religion it's an innocent practice you're you're worshiping nature it doesn't you know like i said there's nothing in there that that specifically mentions the devil so you're made to think okay i'm i'm not calling out to the devil the devil's not in any of these books i'm out here appreciating nature i'm out here worshiping nature um uh trying to do good for for the world and you know don't harm any um so so it like that that's the way that that it sucks you in is because it's made to look like it's light but anybody who has and i'm sure it, anyone on your podcast that, that's going to be listening has heard that um scripture where it talks about you know that that satan himself Come, can come as an angel of light. And that that's what he does. I mean, that Wicca is the perfect example. You know, it, it has you looking for crystals and amulets for your healing. Um, worshiping the stars, worshiping the sun. You know, we're not to worship the creation. We're to worship the creator. So, you know, whether or not it, it specifically mentions the, Satan's name in any of those books is irrelevant. You are not to worship the creation. God intended us to worship him and worship him only. You know, so once you get involved in that and you're, you're sitting here thinking that you're doing okay, and I've had people who are in Wicca say, you know, well, I'm not doing nothing bad. I'm not worshiping the devil. You know, and I'm like, listen, <laughs> you, you're worshiping the creation. We, we were made and created to serve God. The, the amulets for healing, the stones, the crystals, you know, the, the recce healings, you know, all of that is just, it's so deceiving. And there are so many people who are deceived by it, but it leads down to a dark path. Eventually, you will become numb to it, and it won't be enough. So you'll 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 look into a different form of magic, uh, like I did when I when I was in Wicca, you know. And I that's what I thought, you know. Hey, I'm worshiping nature. I'm I'm, you know, I have this goddess, and you know, I'm, it says you know don't do harm to anybody or anything. And I'm just I'm doing good. I care about the environment. I care about all this stuff. I'm not doing anything bad. That's what I honestly thought. And that's all it took. Like just taking that bait is all it took. And then the devil used that to get you into Satanism. And so as you get drawn to these darker forms of magic in the pursuit of power, can you tell us a little bit how your practice changed and what that looked like for you in, uh, in your practice of Satanism? So, you know, I went from doing the tarot cards um, I kind of pulled away from, from the Ouija board over the years as I, you know, got in, became an adult and stuff. It just kind of, I lost interest in it. And I started doing tarot cards. I, you know, started using crystals for healing and for energy and for protection, um, making my moon water and my blessed salt. You know, I, I thought all of that was my good magic. And then when I started getting numb and, and pretty much bored with it, to be honest with you, and I wanted more, like I wanted something deeper. I wanted to experience something deeper. I was looking for some type of fulfillment. And I, when I went from Wicca into like I, I started mixing stuff. So I mixed like Celtic witchcraft and I ended up, I mean, I, I practiced some voodoo. I mean, I, I mixed everything I could find together. And my, my deities changed. So instead of this goddess, it started, you know, going into darker deities. The books that I studied got darker. Um, the things I had on my altar table got darker. Um, the rituals 
got darker and you went from out worshiping nature to getting into the to the pentagram and casting circles and calling on these these guardians and these these spirits and spirit guides which i mean are demons uh, you know, when you start just kind of getting into witchcraft, you get into the darker stuff. It doesn't come out and tell you that's what you're calling on. You know, you got these spirit guides and these um, guardians, and you you go from something light to the the everything got darker. I mean, even the, like the ritual robes got darker. The um, the practices, the spells, like the, I, w- I would get down on, I had like a rug that I put out that had a pentagram on it in front of my altar. So it wasn't there in my house all the time. And even at first, I mean, I didn't even bring this stuff, like display it in my home or anything. When I started getting to the darker stuff, it was like, I didn't even care if it was in my home anymore. You know, I started, you know, left my altar table out on display. Like I, I, I had no, conscience about it being there like I it didn't bother me anymore um from the that that desire for darker deeper things that spiral that I started going down you know I I got into luciferism and I had a statue a big porcelain statue of lucifer that I kept on my altar table um no one full well it was like I hate to say that I, I felt I was, like I was numb, but it's like growing up in church, I should have known better. But it was like, you know, when the Bible talks about your, you know, the enemy blinds them and deaf, you know, deafens their ears and blinds them so that they can't come to realization of who Christ is. And what I should have known better to do or, you know, better not to do. It was like I had no remembrance. I had no conscience. Like I was kneeling down in front of an altar with a statue of Lucifer in front of it. And it was like I had no conscience about what I was doing at all. Um, then when you get into Satanism and, you know, there, there's different kinds of, of people who practice in Satanism. There's some groups who believe, you know, it's there's no devil it's all about self serving self which is <laughs> what the enemy's all about is serving yourself making yourself a god you know serve, serving yourself and your own lustful pleasures and everything else so that, you know they don't even though they, they they will tell you i don't believe in satan we don't worship the devil you're worshiping yourself you know you're you're doing these things that are against god you are worshiping the devil, whether you want to call him that or not. Um, Then there are groups and books and stuff that will call upon him and they will tell you Satan is my God, you know, and I got to the point to where at the end, I mean, that that's where I was at is that Satan was my master. Didn't care to tell people that I went from, from serving a goddess 23 years before to kneeling down in front of, a statue of Satan to the devil and to call on these spirits, these, these demon spirits to try to give me power. Um, you know, there, there were times I would do these ritual baths and, and, and pray and invoke these spirits of lust inside of me so that I would, I, I could entice and, and try to draw people in. Um, anything to make somebody fall, anything to make somebody falter. That's where I got at the end of it. It was like the devil wanted me to do it. I was going to do it. And I didn't care the cost. Um, and I, I mean, I've got scars all over me from where I had cut myself. I've got 13 satanic tattoos all over me. <laughs> um, but they're a reminder for me of where God brought me from. You know, I, I see these scars and stuff now. And instead of it being something that that is tormenting to me now, it just reminds me of God's grace and and Christ and the power of his blood to set you free. Um, that That's what they remind me of now. But, you know, it, it got really dark. And I mean, it was like. 
there were there were orgies and and you know drinking and partying and that anything that that would be held sacred there was no sacred to any of it there you know there at the end there was nothing that was sacred um it seems to me almost like it's a complete inversion of everything that god calls good and absolutely if, if anything anything that is sacred and pure satan will mock it he he's got something for it and that's why we have to be so careful because it's like you know and i know i'm kind of bouncing around but it's like i think about i seen a an ad on facebook that somebody was had posted and they were talking about they've got this jesus board now and it's a Ouija board with a picture of Jesus on it. And they're saying, you can talk to Jesus on this Ouija board. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, I'm like, they are angel cards. You know, all these things are trying to, the enemy's trying to make it to where people think, okay, it's not that bad. You know, and it, people will be deceived by that. You would think that people would know better, but there will be me- so many deceived by it. So many will be deceived by it. Yeah, and before, I mean, it, it's just, like, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. One thing I did want to ask you about, uh, we were talking a little bit about it before, but I really wanted to get it on video is you were talking about how recently you see all of these things that you were involved in, in, in the public eye so much more, whereas previously it used to be kept a secret. Would you be able to tell us a little bit more about that and your experience of that? It was like when I first started, you know, not as like a, even, even when I was like 12, 13 years old, when I started kind of looking and, and you know, playing around dabbling and stuff, um, trying to get that answer that I so was looking for, you, you, you couldn't find occult things. When I started actually practicing you know, you, you couldn't go to the mall and, and buy a book or, you know, go to the local shop down the road. When when I became and started identifying myself as a witch and knew that's what I was going to do, I was I was practicing witchcraft. I, I called myself a witch to myself, but it was like you you didn't go around and tell people that you kept that stuff quiet. Like you, you didn't tell people, Hey, I'm a, I'm a witch or I'm a Satanist. You know, you, you were going to get backlash for that. But today it's everywhere. Like you cannot walk into your local bookstore without seeing a whole section dedicated to witchcraft. Uh, you can go right down the road and buy a satanic Bible or um, a Nicomicron, which was a book that back in those days you couldn't get a hold of. Um, Ouija boards. I mean, and there's no age limit on this stuff is what's even scarier about it. It's like parents need to realize that too, because it's become so open and, and accepted today is there's no age limit on this stuff. Your, your child can go into the store and buy satanic books, buy books on witchcraft, buy Ouija boards, buy whatever they want and take it right home. There's nothing to stop them. Um, you got, you know, like the satanic temple, you, they've been on the news lately, um, like Fox news and MSNBC, like all these, I open it up and it's the first page my computer opens up to by default. And I'm like the satanic temples doing this and the satanic temples doing that. And I'm like, years ago, you would not have seen that. Even though I know like Anton LaVey had his place in San Francisco, but it was something that wasn't talked about. And now it's like, if you don't, accept them you're a bad person you know if you don't think it's right or you say something to somebody uh, you're you're a bad person but it's not trying to be a bad person it's trying to open your eyes and it's like somebody like me who was in that stuff for 23 years I mean I cannot tell you we would be here all night if I told you about the bondage and the the chains that I was in the darkness that I was in the hopelessness I felt you know, all the things that happened to me that that had me so destroyed on the inside, it it doesn't tell you what all that leads to. And it makes it, you know, somebody, somebody like me is trying to tell you, you know, don't don't open yourself up to this stuff. If, you, if you're involved in in Wicca, get out of it, you know, give your life to Christ. It's going to lead you down a deep, dark 
path. And I mean, the, 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 when I talk about the chains and the bondage, I mean, there was so much depression and anxiety and hopelessness. That's all I felt. I mean, I used to have to drink myself to sleep. I would have to take so many shots. And I mean, I was drinking pure tequila, whatever I get my hands on, just to sleep at night. I had no peace, no true joy. I mean, I would fake joy, you know, and you go to these rituals and 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 be with the, the coven that I was high priestess of, you know, and you would laugh and smile and dance and everything else. But there was there was nothing there. There was no true peace. There was no joy. It was nothing but but darkness all around me. And I suffered from so much shame and so much guilt. And I felt so used and so unloved. But, you know, that's where the enemy wants you at. He wants to get you to that point. And it don't take Satanism or witchcraft to get you to that point. You know, he will he will use anything he can to try to get you to the lowest point of your life to whether you either take your life or you give up altogether. And, you know, that's why I try to bring light to this stuff. That's why I try to share my testimony to tell people, you know, you th- this stuff is not what the world tries to make it out to be. It's It's not OK. It's not fun and games. You know, they may seem like they're happy for a moment, but there's got, there's a price to pay for being involved in this stuff and Satan will collect. What do you make of some of the news articles we're seeing now about the satanic temple and the abortion rights issue and so on? There's a lot of Christians talking about that at the minute. Oh, we didn't even plan to discuss that, but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts around that. I do, you know, and that that touches home for me, too, because um, when I was involved there at the end, when I got in, you know, was in the deeper side of witchcraft and was transitioning over to Satanism, um, I went through an abortion and it, it was very haunting and traumatizing to me. Um, And it's something that even now, I mean, it, there's not a day goes by that it's it, it, it's not brought up into my mind. And so when I seen that about the Satanic Temple and them wanting to open up this um, clinic of their own and doing these Satanic rites. And what what bothered me the most about it was, you know, how on the article or anything, you can see the thumbs up and thumbs down. It was like there was so many like people praising this and and giving thumbs up on it saying, yeah, let's do it. You know, good for you. You're standing up for, for women's rights and stuff like that. I'm like, no, they're not. Hey, one thing, one thing I did kind of want to ask you too, um, just because we don't really understand. A lot of people don't really understand what, what do you mean when you say that the devil gave you assignments and things like that? Like, cause for me as a Christian, right. My practice is like, I go to church. I love my neighbor. I might uh, tithe, I might give money to the poor, I might, you know, like all these things that we see in the New Testament being asked of believers. And w- what's like the practice like in the church of Satan? Like what should Christians actually know is going on here in order to help these people? There, when, you, when you're seeking something from, from Satan, He'll give it to you, but you're going to pay a price. There's something that you're going to have to do. And, you know, to, to, I know that this is going to sound so crazy, but it was like, I had got so into this demonic worship and all this evilness at the end that these demonic spirits would, would talk to me. And I know but they would and they would be like you know we want you to to affect this person and they want you know if they wanted to take this person out if they wanted to affect this person and destroy their life you know the, the devil knows how to play your fiddle he knows what your weaknesses are he knows what'll get you 
He's not going to tempt you with something that's not going to bother you. So he, he knows those weaknesses. So, you know, if it was lust that they wanted to use, then, you know, I would use these spells and these rituals to invoke these spirits inside of me that, I mean, it would make it to where they were so tempting. They would just draw you right in. And I mean, you wouldn't even have to do anything. It's like they would just suck them right in. So would it be fair to say that there are people that are theistic Satanists in the sense they believe in a real devil that are out there trying to manipulate Christians, break up families and churches? Because I think often, so that's a real thing that's occurring. Absolutely. There, there were times, and I mean, I, I thank, I thank God for forgiveness. I thank the Lord for, for setting me free from it. Amen. But in all honesty, I mean, there were times that there were, there were people in the church that, you know, the enemy wanted to be knocked down. And I mean, I would go and, and do these rituals and, and invoke these spirits and go to them and entice them with lust to get them to, to sleep with me and, you know, have let these lustful thoughts in to open them up to the enemy, to try to destroy them. These were people, you know, one or two of them was in the church. And this was at right before, probably about six, eight months before um, the Lord started dealing with my heart. You know, they, they, there was one in particular. I mean, it, it was like he was singled out, but he was doing good in the church. And I'm telling you something, he let his guard down. And I mean, it, I was right there offer, offering a hand. And I mean, all it took was just a bat of the eye and a little, little, little enticing. And, you know, it, it went from there. <laughs> I think as Christian just, men in ministry, we need to know about this. Like we need to hear about this because hearing that from you now, I've heard stories of that occurring, but I think a lot of Christians think that it's almost like a conspiracy theory that there really are people out there in the occult that are trying to, infiltrate the church using these methods and you've just told us yeah. that you would actually get instructions from these demonic entities to specifically target men am i understanding that correctly that's huge absolutely that that is absolute truth you know and, and people can can i'm telling them right now that they would send me in to entice I mean, they, they honed in on whoever it was. It was like they honed in. It was this specific person. You're going to go about it this way. And I mean, all it would take was just a little bit of enticing. And that guard was down. And you let that guard down. I mean, the enemy, especially if you're doing stuff and, and trying to, to get closer to God, you, you even more have to keep that guard up because the enemy wants to take you out. And you've got to know your weaknesses and, and address them weaknesses to God so that he can give you strength and he can help you through those things. Because if not, the devil knows how to play your fiddle. He knows what to come at you with. And I mean, this, this, the last person that this happened to was very much involved in his church. Um, he started having a little, little tiffies with his wife. They honed in on him. I went in, did what I was supposed to do. And I mean, I'm just going to say it ended up sleeping with him and he ended up leaving the church. He got in an argument, fight with the pastor. He got a fight with his wife. His wife left him. I mean, it was, and there it was. And I was like, done next, you know, this happened through probably eight or nine years when I started really getting heavily involved into the Satanism and the darker side of it is when, you know, I was invoking these spirits and wanted this stuff to happen. Like, use me, use me however you want. You tell me to do it. I'll do it. That's, that's, that's how it got. And that's, that's where I was at. It was and like, it's very I had transactional, to right? So like yeah. you are doing something for the devil. The devil is then doing something for you, right? Is that what you were Absolutely. explaining before? And so that's yes. really if the you want appeal from him. Then you're going to do this for me. And then I'll do that for you. You know, that kind of thing. Right. There's a price to pay for anything. You know, I had somebody ask me one time is like the, does, does magic and that kind of stuff work? And I'm like, it has to work. If it didn't work, the devil couldn't keep you. He couldn't, 
intrigue you. He couldn't get you to go deeper. He couldn't get, get you to give more of yourself to him. So of course it works, but there's a price to pay. And that price is death. You don't realize it at the time, but that price is death. I mean, it's death to everything. It's not just, I'm not just talking about physical death. I'm talking about to get to the, to the point where you are, you are spiritually and emotionally and mentally dead. To me, that's, that's even scarier than death, like physical death to feel nothing. And I mean, that's how I was. I felt nothing. It's like, you know, I, I would go do this. It was like, if it, if it had to be like a, a, a naked picture or something or a video or something, something just to send to them. And it was like, all I needed you to do was open the door. Just give me a, just give me a little crack. Just open the door, just a crack. That's all I needed to send all the hell at you. And that's why, you know, when I read, started reading the Bible after I got saved, it was, you know, I was seeing it, be diligent, be diligent, be diligent, be diligent, guard your heart, guard your heart. And I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> guard your heart, guard your heart, be vigilant because the enemy is prying around and he is looking to devour you. Do not give him an opportunity. All those Bible verses, don't give the devil an opportunity you know, be vigilant, be on guard, you know, that the Ephesians 6, the armor of God, get into that with everything that's in you, especially nowadays, be on guard. Amen. I'm so glad I asked you that, actually. That was super helpful for my own understanding. I'm, I'm sure it's, it's going to help a lot of people. Me, it's just, if I could tell people anything, it's like those scriptures right there, do not read over them and not take it to heart. You need to to write that in your heart, write it on your mind, Remind yourself daily to make sure that you're, if there's any weak spots in your armor, that you go to God with it and you let him, him deal with you on that and get it fixed because he's out there and the enemy is looking to take you out. Especially if you're doing stuff for God, especially if you're bringing attention to the works of the enemy, to, to, to open people's eyes. If you're out there proclaiming the name of Jesus, you better watch yourself. Stay guarded. Stay, stay vigilant, stay in the word of God. That, that is my, stay close to God, get in prayer, you know, get in that relationship with Jesus. That's, that's, that's where you're going to survive it. Amen. And I, yeah, because I interrupted you before, I'd love it if you could continue yeah. with your come with your come to Jesus moment where the devil, everything's transactional. Jesus gives you his grace freely. What's it like being serving uh, Christ lately for you? Well, I can tell you, you know, one of my favorite set of scriptures is Psalms 139, you know, where it talks about, you know, even if I make my bed in hell, you're there. It's like, there is nowhere. And that's one thing that we all need to realize is there's nowhere that Jesus won't go to reach you. Like he, he'll, he'll go to the dark place that you're at. He'll go to the, to the crack house. He'll go to the back alley. He'll go to your living room, you know, where, where Jesus found me. And started dealing with my heart. You know, um, I used to take martial arts. And I did Brazilian jiu-jitsu for like seven years. And this pastor joined our group. God love his heart because he drove me insane. <laughs> Every time he would see me, he would come to me and say, Jesus loves you. And I mean, it would just rear up so much anger and hatred in me. And I mean, I called this man everything but a child of God. And he just would still come up to me and say, smile and say, Jesus said, tell you he loves you. And I told him one day out in the parking lot, I was like, look, stop saying that to me. Jesus does not love me. He would never want to love me. I'm like, stop saying that to me. And then I would go home and I would talk. It would just make me mad because I would be tossing in the bed at night and be like, Jesus doesn't love me. How could Jesus love me? Why would he want anything to do with me? And I, you know, just be tussling with it. And um, I was in the middle of doing a ritual and I had my altar set out and I had my pentagram rug in the floor and I had my ritual robe on. And I actually got down and kneeled down in the middle of that pentagram and started saying, like reciting my, my prayer and reciting my words for my ritual. And I heard a voice plain as day as like, I'm talking to you say, who are you even praying to? And I mean, it scared me to where I fell backwards 
and looked around the room because I thought somebody was in the room with me. And I mean, I looked around, I didn't see nobody. And I just kind of looked up. And when I looked up, it was like there were scales or something like dry skin, scaly stuff coming off of my eyes. Like I could literally feel it falling from my eyes and from down my face to where I was like going like this, but there was nothing there. And all of that stuff on that altar, because it was candlelight, you know, and I had like these herbs burning and sage burning. And so it was kind of smoky, but it was like all that smoke and stuff cleared up. And my vision was so perfectly clear. But it was like I was in an utter state of confusion because I was looking at that altar. I was looking down at myself. I was in this robe. And I was like, what am I doing? You know, and I kind of got up and I blew the candles out and I took everything off and took my robe off and just went to bed. And so that right there started, you know, it started bothering me. And I was like, I don't know. I, you know, I heard that. I don't know why, you know, it just like everything that was in me just stopped like wanting to do it. I didn't want to set up my altar. I had no interest in and getting stuff ready anymore to to do the all to do the uh, rituals and my prayers and um, this preacher every time he'd see me he keep telling me Jesus loves you Jesus loves you and then he invited me to come to church and he said I want you to come Easter Sunday and I was like I'm not coming to your church I'm like you I'm not gonna do it and then he would just keep agging it on hang on me won't you come church won't you come church Easter and so um, Easter Sunday. I got ready and I went into that church with just out of spite. I had no desire. It was out of pure spite. And I sat down in that service and I was listening to them, but it was like, I wasn't hearing a word they were saying, like the singing and the preaching. And I sat there and I, I had my arms crossed like this and I was just sitting back in that pew and I was looking around at all the decorations. You know, they had to decorate for Easter. And, had to, you know, the cross was back behind on the uh, back of the church. And I was just sitting there looking around at all of it. And I was just started, like, asking God, like, how could you love me? Why would you want to? It's like I, I was sitting there having a conversation with God. And I was like, you know, I willingly turned away from you. I knew you. When I was little, I knew you. I knew who you was. And I willingly walked away from you. I drug your name through the mud. You know, I, I did blasphemous things. I willingly bowed down to your arch enemy and gave everything I had to him and served him for the last 23 years of my life. Like, why would you love me? Why would you want anything to do with me? And it was like, someone come up behind me and put their arms around me and like the sweetest, warmest, gentlest hug I had ever felt in my entire life. And that moment it broke. I just started bawling. I mean, it was like almost like a daddy would come up behind you and just kind of put his arms around you. Like it was the warmest hug that I had ever felt. And I cried for a few minutes and I got up and I mean, I totally interrupted their service because I got up and I was shaking. My knees was shaking. My hands was shaking, bawling, crying. And I got up and went up to the the uh, pulpit area there. And the pastor that had been um, telling me Jesus loves me. So he wasn't the one preaching that Easter service. He had like a special person come in to speak. And he leaned down and he said, um, what can I do for you? And I looked up at him and I said, I'm a witch and I don't want to be anymore. And I literally collapsed right there on that altar. That pastor had been witnessing to me come running up. Everybody come running up. And, you know, they started praying with me and praying for me. And I mean, it was like everything off of me just broke. And I mean, it, it's been... It's been it, it, it's been an experience because I can tell you the the Lord had to give me quite a talking to <laughs> when, I, when I gave my life to him and I got saved. I mean, he he started digging up stuff out of me and and dealing with a lot of things that was there. And um, you know, he had to do a lot of healing. You know, when it when it come to the abortion and stuff. You know, I was so tormented by that. And 
the enemy used it a lot to torment me. But, you know, it was one thing that, the, you know, the Lord told me, you got to give it to me. Let me have it so I can heal it. You know, and I just sat down and I just cried and, and prayed and told God everything about it, my feelings about it, because he knows our hearts anyway. He knows what we feel. He just wants us to give it to him. And, you know, he he's healed me from that. He's healed my heart from that. He's given me hope. And, you know, one day that child, I'm going to see that child again. I'm going to be able to, to, to see that child in heaven. You know, that, that's, a, that's a hope that I have. And it's a beautiful hope for anybody who, who's went through that. You know, Jesus can heal you from that. He can heal your heart. He can heal all those dark, wounded, broken places that you think there's no, there's no healing for them. Jesus can heal it. You know, all that depression and all that anxiety and all that hatred and anger. I mean, cause I was an extremely angry person. I mean, I had a major attitude problem after being in that stuff for all them years, but it was like, even the way I looked like my physical appearance changed. It's like, if you take a picture of me before and after it's like, you can't really even tell it's the same person anymore. Cause all that darkness is gone from my eyes. And, um, Every all the all the hurt, the shame, the guilt. He has taken every bit of that. And he has healed it and he has set me free. You know, one person who I can say just from from what I know of myself and what the things that I did in the name of Satan. It, it still amazes me of God's love for us and the love of Jesus for us and his desire to set us free that he would even want anything to do with me. But that's the beauty of the cross and that's the beauty and the power of the blood of Jesus Christ because n none of that could hold me down when, when the blood of Jesus came in. No, nothing that I had done his blood couldn't wash away. Nothing that held me bound. None of those chains that the enemy had me with because he thought he had me. He thought he had me. And it, if I had stayed in that, I would have died and went to hell. I, there's no doubt in my mind. If I would have stayed, I would have ended up taking my life or something bad was going to happen to me. You know, that was where the enemy wanted me. He wanted me gone in, in his kingdom. You know, to be transferred from that darkness into the kingdom of light, to be redeemed, to be set free from all of that, to be healed and to be healed in places and from things that it amazes me. I mean, that that's that's Jesus. That that is Jesus. He wants to heal us. He wants us to, he wants to set us free. You don't, you don't have to be bound. You don't have to be bound in darkness. You don't have to be bound by anything. Jesus wants to set you free. All, all you got to do is come to him. That's all I had. That's all I had to do. And he was right there. Like, where are you being? You know, where, where, where are you being? I've been waiting on you. You know, and he, it wasn't, it didn't matter the, the stains and the the scars and the things that I had done. It was just like he he just took me right in and just started cleaning me up and just started loving on me and showing me who he really was. And I can tell you that there ain't nothing that this world has or the enemy has to offer that compares to even the slightest of anything that God has for you. I mean, I, the way that I feel is like this morning I was driving to work and it's kind of dark when I leave and, you know, the sun started coming up and I, that brung back to my mind. And I had posted it on Facebook this morning about, you know, I can remember being in darkness and being surrounded by darkness and there was no, no light, no hope, no joy, no warmth. And then when I seen that sun coming over at mountain and it started piercing into the car at me. I was like, that, that's what it was like. It was like that light of Jesus that pierced that darkness and that warmth started rolling in. It was like that darkness had to flee. It, the darkness can't stand to be in the light of Jesus. It, it has to go. And, the, you know, the enemy has to let go. He, he can't have no hold on you if, you if you give your life to Jesus. It's gone. He has to let you go. 
And that freedom coming from that mess that I was in to the freedom that I have found in Jesus. I mean, every, every day, every day. And I've been a Christian for seven years now. And every day is, is a new experience with him. I mean, it, it has been so wonderful. There was something I wrote down today that I just wanted to say, uh, something that Charles Spurgeon had said, and it's wrote in the front of my Bible, and I just love it. And it says, there may be some sins of which a man cannot speak, but there is no sin which the blood of Christ cannot wash away. None. So if he can wash away my sins and the things that I've done, he can, he can wash anybody's sins away. I mean, no, there's nothing that Jesus' blood can't, can't set you free from. Amen. I don't know if we can finish on a more powerful note than the end of your testimony in a quote from Charles Spurgeon. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I, that's I wrote that when I read that. I wrote it in the front of my Bible. <laughs> it was like real big. So that, I mean, because it just hit me so hard. This is like you know, there there's no sin. There's nothing in my past. There's nothing that that I have done that the blood of Jesus can't wash away. Amen. And so, Carrie, people already know that they can find you on Facebook and on Instagram. And so, I'd encourage you to all go and do that. You're very active on Facebook, especially I notice. Um, and so that's excellent. And are you okay for people to reach out to you if uh, they have any questions? They can message me on Facebook if they want to. Um, if they have any questions or need to talk about anything, need prayer, anything like that. I mean, I'm I'm this I'm very real and very genuine. And I will, if I don't know the answer, we're going to find out. <laughs> you know, we'll, <laughs> we'll find it together. So I'll do anything I can to help anybody. All right. Excellent. Well, I think for now we've come up, uh, uh, up on over an hour, which was very easy to do given how much we had to talk about, but I think it's time to wrap up. So I just want to thank you all for watching. Please again, do go check out all of uh, the links in the description box below and thank you for your time, Carrie. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for letting me do that. God bless. You too.